Now from the Vatican, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to a very special World Over Live. I'm Raymond Arroyo in Vatican City. Tonight we celebrate and remember Pope John Paul II. In only days he will be beatified here in St. Peter's Square. We will naturally be bringing you live coverage of the entire event and the celebrations surrounding the beatification. But tonight we reflect on this incredible pontificate nearly 27 years He made 104 apostolic journeys and touched the lives and hearts of Catholics and non-Catholics around the world. First, to start us off, we go to George Weigel. He's the Pope's biographer. His best-selling Witness to Hope was a landmark summation of the life of John Paul II. And more recently, he's written The End and the Beginning, a sequel to his best-selling biography. Here's my conversation just today with George Weigel. George, tell me what this means to you personally. I know you were the Pope's biographer, but I know there was also a close relationship there as well. What does this mean, watching him move a step closer to sainthood? I hope it means that the church and the world recognize that this man was first and foremost a Christian disciple. Uh, In all the emphasis on John Paul II's accomplishments as Pope, as statesman, as teacher of the church, I think there's a tendency to forget that what made all of that happen was radical conversion to Christ. This man was first and foremost a radically converted Christian disciple. He was, as Billy Graham put it at his death, the great Christian witness of the second half of the 20th century. Everything flowed from that. And it's important to hold on to that at this moment because that's his connection to us. Very few of a billion Catholics in the world are going to enjoy the range of natural talents that were lavished on Carol Wojtyla. But every baptized person has a chance to be that radically converted Christian Mm -hmm. disciple. So if we focus on that, he won't drift away from us into a kind of Superman status. Now, I have heard some of the grousing I know you have here in Rome, as well as back in the United States and elsewhere. What's the rush? Why so fast? Why was this fast-tracked when you've got other popes, indeed other very saintly figures, sort of sitting on the sidelines? They're not moving nearly this quickly. What do you respond to that? This is media pack journalism at its worst. First of all, this isn't a rush. The only thing that was changed in this process is that Pope Benedict waived the five-year waiting period to begin it. It's the same thing John Paul II did for Mother Teresa. Nobody said, that's a rush job. Mm -hmm. The people who are carping about this beatification fall into two categories. One, progressive Catholics who are mad at John Paul II for not turning the Catholic Church into another liberal Protestant denomination. And ultra-traditionalists who are angry at him for not repealing the 20th century, which of course was an absurd uh, a proposal in the first place. The people of the church made their judgment on this very clear on the day of his funeral. You were here, I was here, those chants of Santo Subito went up. The official judgment of the church is now catching up with the popular will of the people of the church. I will say, in closing on this point, that it is strange in the extreme that people who are constantly calling for more democracy in the church should be complaining when the will of the people is agreed to by the authorities of the church in this beatification. Now, people hear the pope is being beatified, John Paul II is going to be beatified. They don't quite understand what that means. Talk to us a moment about heroic virtue and what this designation, which is really what it is, by the Holy Father and the congregation, what this means. If you look at the uh, document that was given to uh, all the people who were asked to be official witnesses in this process, as I was, uh, it was divided into two two sections. One was a biographical section, which I could answer by simply saying, here's the book. Uh, And the second was an analysis of this man's character organized through the virtues, theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, Uh, the cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and uh, courage. And you were asked to think through this life 
through the prism of those virtues, which is a very interesting way to think through a life. In fact, it's so interesting that I adopted it for the third part of the end and the beginning and organized uh, a long overview of the Pope's life and accomplishments through the prism say, of those virtues. That book, and this is the, the, we should tell people, this is the sequel, if you will, to Witness to Hope. And it really is a primer on this life. I just recently reread that whole latter part of the book. And it, it gives you, it is an interesting way to almost meditate on the life of John Paul II as you take in these events that you might have missed along the way. And this isn't asking you whether you agree or disagree with everything this man did, every decision he made, etc. It's asking you to make the judgment, were those decisions made in good faith? Were they made without fear or favor? Were they made with a clear conscience? And I have to say, Raymond, after 15 years of immersing myself in this life and writing over 1,600 pages uh, about it in these two books, uh, my answer to that is yes. Uh, my answer to that is yes. It doesn't mean I agree with every decision the Pope made any more than he agreed with everything I wrote about how he had done things. Uh, the question is one of uh, the process of decision making and the virtues that were brought uh, to bear on. You have been very candid, not only in your recent writing, but also in the original biography and the, the newest addition to this biography about the failings of John Paul II. I want you to first talk about those, and then I want to move into the virtues of John Paul that we should keep in mind so that this weekend just doesn't, doesn't just become a one-off event, oh, that was nice watching it all, but it becomes something we can actually take part in and take away from. I think he identified his own biggest faults in that little book, Rise, Let Us Be On Our Way, that was a kind of memoir of his life as a bishop published a few years before his death. Uh, he said he, was, he had been too reluctant to discipline people. In Krakow. In Krakow, and I think he would extend that to, uh, to the larger church. He had the fault of many saintly people. Namely, he was too patient with other people. I mean, people were given a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. Beyond that, I think his, this defect, uh, if it be a defect, was a defect of his virtues. He had such respect for others that he didn't want to make a spectacle of, of anybody. He didn't want to make an example of anybody. And sometimes in a large organization, it has to be seen that failure has consequences. This is a large problem for the church going into the future. How do we deal with failed leadership uh, in the church? But um, it's much more fruitful, I think, to uh, think about his life through the prism of the virtues that he lived of which his faith, his hope, and his charity were, were manifest, but I'd like to focus on his courage. Uh, I think the farther we get from those last months, uh, the more they loom large as a kind of summation of his entire life, his entire magisterium, his entire witness. This was a courage that was not stoicism. It was a courage that was not denial. It's the kind of courage that comes on the far side of Calvary. It's the kind of courage that comes from conforming your life to the crucified Lord in the sure knowledge that Easter follows Good Friday. And that's why in the end and the beginning, I describe his last months as the last encyclical. This was the last great teaching moment. And there, all of these virtues developed over a lifetime in cooperation with grace were on display in perhaps the most powerful two and a half months of his 26 and a half year pontificate. You touch on it in the book about this mystical sense that he had. Uh, his, his, he, not only the way he prayed, but his grasp and view of the world. He didn't look at it in political terms or in, in, in economic terms. He, he truly saw this as this battle between good and evil, as you point out in the, in the book. But uh, talk to me a little bit about that mystical sensibility and sense that he had, as well as his emphasis on divine mercy, which is, of course, the feast day that this beatification falls on. I think growing up as he did 
in the horrors of occupied Poland during the Second World War. Then living through the brutalities of the early Stalinist period in Poland. Uh, Karol Wojtyła came to a deep, existential, felt understanding that in the middle of the 20th century, great tears had been ripped in the, fab the fabric of humanity, the moral fabric of humanity. And that's why he became convinced, I think, that this revelation of divine mercy, uh, the visions of Sister Faustina, were not intended just for Poland, but for the whole world. That uh, at this moment in history, what humanity needed was to see the face of the merciful Father to whom confession of this wickedness can be made and forgiveness received and reconciliation effected. In one of his last great teaching documents on the church in Europe, uh, the Pope reflected upon the difficulties of a continent which is ridden with guilt over the 20th century, but because it's abandoned the God of the Bible, has no one to whom that can be confessed, and therefore no one from whom forgiveness can be received. Th that's, if you will, the, the negative side, the underside of this uh, insistence on uh, the divine mercy as the particular face of the Father being turned to the world at this moment in time. Talk to me a little bit uh, in our final moments about this emphasis on culture. He always saw culture from the very beginning as a way, of, as a means of moving history and man as opposed to uh, a, a political emphasis. Well, or an economic emphasis. I mean, his life was a refutation of the Jacobin heresy of the French Revolution, power is everything, politics is everything, or the Marxist heresy, that history is simply the, the exhaust fumes of economic processes. Uh, he insisted that it was culture that moved history over the long haul, and that at the heart of culture, like at the beginning of the word culture in English, is cult what people cherish, honor, and worship, what people are willing to stake their lives and their children's lives on. That's, that's the dynamic of the human story over time. And that's how he changed the world. He gave back to the people of Poland in June 1979 their authentic culture, which is to say their true identity. And out of that came tools of resistance that communism could not match. Final question. In the, let's talk about this cultural impact. We have this huge celebrity-fied royal wedding taking place in London the same weekend or just days before this beatification. What impact will this beatification have and is it, is it being given the attention that it deserves and therefore will it carry on or, and will the message convey in the way that I think Pope Benedict intends? I hope so, Raymond, and I think so. I mean, this, pan this man has proven over the six years since his death to be a powerful intercessor, uh, despite the ridiculous carping of the last uh, several weeks. His reputation throughout the world is, I think, higher than ever. Uh, there will be hundreds of thousands of people flocking to Rome simply to say, I was here, I was able to say thank you. Next Wednesday, very few people uh, except the souvenir vendors who didn't sell what they thought they were going to sell, are going to remember this royal wedding. A lot of people, tens of millions of people, will remember this beatification mm -hmm. and take inspiration from it. It also reminds us of the importance of, and I think the reality of the communion of saints, which we've lost sight of in the world, I think, in many ways. So. A lot of people feel a deep personal connection to this man. And for the church to say, yes, this was a life of heroic virtue, this is a life now being lived in the presence of the Lord, uh, is a great affirmation of the reality of the communion of saints. George Weigel will be providing live commentary on MSNBC during their coverage of the beatification, but since you won't be seeing George here on EWTN, I thought I should show him to you now. You know, as I wander about Rome, you see these little kiosks and gift shops, each have what I like to call papal chotskis for sale. And there seems to be an abundance of them given this beatification. We sent our cameras out to chronicle some of the good, bad, and the ugly. Oh, 
that's a terrible shirt. And who can resist the John Paul II bobblehead? After rummaging through many of these stores, I finally found an image that I think captures the Pope's reaction to all of this kitsch. Our World Over Live will continue from Rome in a moment. Archbishop Donald Whirl of Washington will be here to offer his reflections on Pope John Paul II. And a little later, our own Joan Lewis will give her remembrances of Pope John Paul II. Stay right there. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to this very special World Over Live from St. Peter's. I'm Raymond Arroyo. As you can see, preparations are underway for this big beatification on Sunday. But before we left Washington, we spoke to the Archbishop there, Donald Whirl, who offered his own moving reflections on Pope John Paul II. Take a look. Tell me, in 1978, you were at the conclave. You were one of the very few cardinals in the room at that conclave that elected John Paul II. Tell me about that. Well, I was there in the capacity as an assistant to Cardinal Wright. Ah. He needed uh, an assistant because he was confined to a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So I had the privilege of being present throughout that conclave. The entire conclave, you were yes. in the room. And uh, one of the things I will always remember, though, is at the end of at the end of the conclave after the pope had stepped out onto the balcony and given his blessing to the whole world mm. then he came back in and he went and greeted every single one of the cardinals mm. and and this young priest who was standing in the background trying to be unseen <laughs> it was a it was a wonderful wonderful moment what did you think of him observing him because i mean sitting there in the sistine chapel and watching this whom I imagine before that was an unknown quantity to you. You didn't, uh, uh, how familiar were you with uh, well, Cardinal Wartio? Well, well, Cardinal Wartio was on the board of the Congregation for the Clergy. Oh. So not only did I have the, the great privilege of, of knowing him, when we went to Poland, when Cardinal Wright traveled to Poland and I went with him, we stayed with Cardinal Wojtyla. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so, so you had a lot of familiarity with him. Yes, you knew exactly yes. who you were dealing with. And then, of course, came, uh, came the, uh, the election. But this little piece, uh, in, the, uh, in the conclave, the, the night that the conclave was sealed, mm -hmm. after the dinner, and it was still fairly early in the evening. Mm. Uh, and after I had assisted Cardinal Wright and got him back, uh, settled into his room, I went out into the cortile, the cortile San mm -hmm. to get some air. You know that mm -hmm. very, sure. very well, that area. In, inside, this is inside the Vatican, inside, inside the, the Apostolic Vatican, Palace. inside the Apostolic Palace, inside the conclave. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of cardinals walking around saying their rosary, just... Mm -hmm quietly praying, not talking to each other, but just, and all of a sudden, I feel this uh, hand on my arm, and I turn, and it's Cardinal Wojtyla. And he says, we will continue to walk, and we will talk, so I can practice my English. <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> wow, what a great story and a great moment. Here, you know, this is the well, what did you talk about? Well, I can't say. Oh, you can't break the seal. <laughs> now, wait, you weren't part of that conclave. You were just an observer That's there. right. Okay. But I still had to take the oath. Oh, you did? Oh, yes. Uh, I have hanging on my wall at my residence here oh. in Washington the, the declaration that I had taken the oath and could enter the conclave, and it was a very solemn one. Wow. You knelt in the Pauline Chapel, mm -hmm. uh, and you uh, put your hand on the Book of Gospels and you indicated that you would not reveal the secrets of the conflict. Mm. So we, we, so we, we can't You'll never even, know. We can't <laughs> even know in a future book. There's not, there's not, there's, it'll never come out. Tell me, you've written a new book on John Paul II. Um, tell me what, and it really, it's called Blessed John Paul II. Wait, I'll give you the title. Yeah. It's The Gift of Blessed, Blessed. John Paul yes. II. What does this beatification mean to you personally 
and to the church? Well, to me personally, and I never realized until I started going over all of those encyclicals and apostolic mm -hmm. exhortations, just how much I had uh, been influenced by, how much my, my ministry had been molded by the thought of John Paul II, mm -hmm. and, and how much I, how deeply I had an affection for him as teacher and pope. Mm -hmm. uh, it had that wonderful, wonderful uh, effect on me. The, uh, the idea that he would be beatified, declared mm -hmm. blessed, said to me, the whole world knows that this was a man of God. Mm -hmm. At the funeral, they were all shouting, Santo Subito, canonization yeah. now. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's the closest we have seen in modern history to a canonization by acclamation. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a beatification by acclamation. The whole, the whole world is saying, this man was a man of God. Now, some are saying the process is too fast. The church should take its time. There were even, there's even some grumbling I heard from those near and within the congregation. Your thoughts on that, on that critique, that we should let history evolve a bit. We're still so emotionally attached to John Paul II, particularly those of us who knew him. Yeah. I think it, uh, you can always make the case that there's a wisdom in process, mm -hmm. but there's also a recognition of the spirit. There's a recognition of the movement of the Spirit. We had nearly 27 years to observe this pontiff. And we did. And what did we, what did we see? We saw a holy man who continually challenged us, be not afraid, step out into the deep, open your hearts to Christ, have this living relationship with God. We, we heard that over and over again, but more than that, we saw it lived in his life. Right. And so when, when the crowds cried out, Santo Subito, this was an acclamation of the Catholic faithful around the world. Mm -hmm. And it was the movement of the spirit, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think what Pope Benedict is simply saying is, it's pretty obvious mm -hmm. <laughs> that we're dealing with someone who is truly a man of God. Mm -hmm. a, a sign of what I take to be the, the movement of the spirit, what's going on uh, today, we have so great a response in terms of vocations, younger vocations, men coming out of high school, men in, in the early years of college. We have so many that we're opening a college level seminary and house of formation. And you're calling it? We're calling it the Pope John Paul II. It'll be Blessed John Paul II Second. Seminary. Now there's another important event taking place in that week of beatification in that you will be taking possession of your titular church in Rome. And this isn't just some little side chapel somewhere on some forgotten street. Tell us the church and what's going to happen when you take possession. Well, one of, the, one of the reasons I feel so blessed uh, in, in this pontificate is because in November when I was named a cardinal and the Pope uh, calls out uh, the, the church that you're going to receive as your titular church, your church in Rome, and then he hands you the papal bull. So when he read that he was giving me the church of St. Peter in chains, uh, I can't tell you how, how thrilled I was. Uh, when I knelt down and he handed me the bull with this beautiful smile on his face, uh, I, I thought to myself, what a beautiful gift. What a beautiful gift from Peter. Uh, as you know, uh, Benedict presides over St. Peter's, where the remains of Peter are buried. On the other side of town, in ancient Rome, is the other church of St. Peter. And this houses the relics of the chains that bound Peter, St. Peter in chains. It's a historic church all the way back at the time of the Council of Ephesus. So now we're talking about fifth century mm -hmm. when the Pope wanted to send a representative 
to that council. He chose the pastor of this church and said, because you're a pastor of one of the ancient churches of Rome. Mm -hmm. In the fifth century, it was already ancient. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a great joy for me to, to take possession of that. I'll church. say, and there's also beautiful Moses, Michelangelo's Moses is there as well, which uh, yes. you know, the, the world, of course, is familiar with, but that's where you can see it up close. It's really a, a splendid church. Yes, so. and that, it, has, it has a little bit of everything because mm -hmm. it has the history of the church mm -hmm. there, the connectedness with Peter, and as you just point out, mm -hmm. that incredibly remarkable Michelangelo Moses. Mm -hmm. And I'm here in a very soggy St. Peter's Square with our friend Joan Lewis, our Rome Bureau Chief, and of course those of you who tune in to television, radio, and the internet blog know it's not only Rome, it's Joan's it's Rome. Rome. So, Joan, great to see you. It's wonderful. Tell me about your first meeting with John Paul II. You related this story to me the other night. It's hilarious. It is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity you think you're going to have mass in the Pope's chapel to talk to him afterwards. And I was so emotional, but I decided after Mass, when we could meet him, that I would speak English. It wasn't his first language, of course, mm -hmm. but I understood that he knew English. His secretary presents me to him. This is the young lady from the press office I told you about. What do I say to the Holy Father? Oh, preface this by saying, in about three days' time, I was going to be moving back to the United States. Mm -hmm. Do you think I told the Pope that? No. Uh -huh. I said to the Holy Father, Holy Father, I'm ending my life in Rome. <laughs> and the Pope had my arm, I got a picture of it, he has my arm, he leaned in and he said, Cosa? What? Huh? And then I went right into Italian, no, no, Holy Father, you misunderstood, I misspoke. I'm moving back to America in a few days. <laughs> so I think he was very concerned he had a suicidal person in his presence. Yeah, we're, and, yeah. Th and thank goodness you didn't follow through, Joan. Tell me about the preparations underway here. There have been banners hung in St. Peter's Square. There are, there, 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 there have, they have lines of pilgrims going in to see the remains of John Paul II. They've moved him upstairs from yes. the, the tomb. What else is happening here? It's been an amazing 24 hours. The banners on the right-hand colonnade, each banner is a year of his pontificate, so 27 banners. And on the left-hand side, we saw the letters going up yesterday, first an S, then a P, then an O, and all of a sudden the words, Spalancate le porte a Cristo, open wide the doors to Christ. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a banner, I don't even know how big this picture is of Pope John Paul. Probably covers like eight of the columns and it goes well beyond, beyond the statues. A we have the papal crests. We have flower vases in Via della Conciliazione, mm -hmm. enormous vases with yellow and white flowers, the colors mm -hmm. of the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And bit by bit, you're seeing the piazza made ready for Sunday. Yeah, it's really, it's going to be a beautiful affair. And of course, Joan, you will be with us as we cover this entire event, both the vigil, the beatification itself, and the Mass of Thanksgiving. Indeed, so indeed. thank you for keeping an eye on things. Now we go to someone, another Vatican insider, uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke. Many of you will remember Cardinal Burke when he was still Archbishop Burke in St. Louis. But now he is the prefect of the Apostolic Signatura, sort of the Vatican's Supreme Court. He sat down with us to offer his thoughts on this beatification and the man who made him a bishop, John Paul II. Take a look. Let's start with this beatification and what does it mean first to you personally? Tell me about your relationship with John Paul. Well, Pope John Paul II, venerable, now soon to be blessed, was the Pope for the greater part of my years as a priest. He uh, was elected in 1978. I had been a priest then for three years and then his long reign coincided with the very significant years of my own priestly development and maturing. And he was, for me, a, a mentor in every way, his teaching, uh, his tireless uh, efforts to bring Christ to as many people as possible, his devotion to the youth, uh, his defense of human life. They're just a whole gamut of aspects of his priestly life and ministry, which became, for me, a model and something to imitate. I have also a very personal relationship with him because it was he who called me to be a bishop and it's he who ordained me a bishop on June 6th of 1995 and uh, I also had the privilege of serving him first before I was a bishop in the apostolic signature as the defender of the bond and and had occasions then to see him from time to time and uh, then it was he who also uh, 
assigned me to St. Louis and, uh, and, and imposed the pallium of the archbishop. So I have many, many memories of this uh, extraordinary man in, in every way and, um, and of his great holiness. How is this beatification being regarded here in the Curia, in Rome itself? With a great deal of enthusiasm, uh, uh, also I would say inspiration. Uh, Pope John Paul II is really venerated here, and, uh, and he uh, was the first non-Italian pope in uh, some 450 years. And I believe that there are no, there's no nation that loves him more than Italy. He really became a, a pastor to Italy in a very particular way. And in addition to his travels all over the world, he made numerous visits to all parts of Italy and, of course, also visited the parishes in Rome. I think he perhaps visited all of them or nearly all of them. And it, which is something that had never been done by a pope before, and certainly not in that way. Remarkable. And then, of course, many people who work in the Roman Curia, including myself, have uh, very uh, personal ties with him. And so uh, we, for us, this is a, a time of great inspiration, and we uh, also are encouraged to invoke more his intercession for various needs of the church. And, one knows there are many of them. What qualities of John Paul would you signal out for people or single out for people this weekend that they should focus on and think about and try to incorporate into their own lives? I would say, first of all, it, it would be his, his spiritual depth and that, to make it more specific, centered in Christ and in Christ, his faith in Christ alive in the church. And this is something that in every way he exemplified in his teaching and I believe that people who met him personally, including myself, uh, came away with the sense that they had encountered uh, another Christ, in other words, Christ's vicar on earth. And I believe also that this was his inspiration in all of the travels and also in all of his teaching, which is probably, I would guess, the greatest body of teaching that any Roman pontiff has left was uh, to, to be a really a shepherd to the universal church. Tell me about this new evangelization that he called us all to. Uh, you've written about this and the, and the centrality of uh, the new evangelization, not only to his message, but to the, the, the efforts of the church going forward. Well, what he saw in the world, and it was also seen by his predecessor, uh, uh, well, John Paul I had little time to address it, but by Paul the, Pope Paul VI, was that the world had grown completely secularized and that the secularization had entered into the church because it was so pervasive in the culture that it had also affected the clergy, it affected religious, it was having its effect in the sacred liturgy, it was having its effect in the church's teaching. So, so what can we do, what should we do, was the, was the question. And, and his response was, we have to teach and worship and give witness as the very first Christians did in, in, a, in a world that was completely pagan, a world that didn't know Christ. We have to return to that, that enthusiasm and that engagement of the first Christians. And then he also would frequently call to mind as he visited very nation, various nations, the first missionaries to those countries, and, and, and say to the people, you need to recover the, the enthusiasm and the engagement, the energy of those, of those first missionaries and of the first Christians and that this is the way uh, to, to bring Christ to the world and to, to re-Christianize it, so to speak. Uh, but, and he said it, it has to be a new evangelization because the world, as he sometimes uses the phrase, the world was carrying on, the culture was carrying on as if God did not exist. Mm -hmm. I was working uh, on Good Friday in my office and I turned the television on there and there you were, flanking the Holy Father as he made his way uh, down the central uh, uh, nave of St. Peter's Basilica. And I know you will be at the beatification and, and uh, concelebrating this weekend. What will be in your heart and mind as you concelebrate this occasion, John Paul II being raised to the, uh, to the, the level of uh, uh, blessed? It will be, uh, first and foremost, just a deep gratitude for the gift that God gave to the church in our time of this very holy uh, shepherd, this pope who was uh, well, heroic in the, in the virtues of faith, hope and charity, heroic in, in his care for the universal church. And so m my heart will be filled with gratitude for 
for the gift of Pope John Paul II, and then also with a, a sense of needing to, to plumb more deeply the gift. In other words, to, to understand more deeply his teaching, to understand more, more deeply the example of his, of his pastoral care of the church. And so uh, those will be the principal sentiments in my heart. Any final thoughts on this beatification, your work here, and anything you want to share with the viewers? My final thought is simply one of hope, a hope that is exemplified in the life of Pope John Paul II, who had every reason to, to be discouraged throughout his lifetime, but who remained always completely confident in Christ, in the life that he was living in Christ in the Catholic Church, and, and never veered from that. And that's the message for all of us. And if we can live deeply our life in Christ in the Catholic Church, faithful to her teaching, faithful to her worship, faithful to her discipline, then we have the greatest gift to give to our world. And it's a gift of hope for everyone, and it's actually what everyone is looking for, even those who, who claim to, to hate us or those who claim that, that somehow we're uh, putting a damper on progress. Mm -hmm. The real progress is that love of Christ. When the World Over Live continues, we'll talk with the man who probably knew John Paul better than any other. Cardinal Stanislaw Zivic, the Archbishop of Krakow, offers his moving reflections on the life and the death of John Paul II and his enduring legacy. When the World Over Live continues, stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. I'm Raymond Arroyo in Vatican City. As we reflect on this life of Pope John Paul II and prepare to celebrate his beatification, there is an interview with an individual that we had to share with you. Cardinal Stanislaw Zivic was the personal secretary of John Paul II for nearly 40 years, both in Poland and here at the Vatican. He offered a book, a memoir of sorts, sharing his spiritual take on John Paul, and he recounted in moving detail the death of the Pope. Here he is during a recent interview with us sharing the same. Take a look. Tell me about those dramatic days in 2005 when His Holiness had to have a tracheotomy, had lost the ability to speak. That had to be very difficult for him. It was a difficult time because every shepherd needs his voice especially for this pope, who was an actor in a certain sense, which means he worked with his voice. That was a great sacrifice on his part, just to lose his great predilection, his great ability to use the voice. I remember the last blessing at the St. Peter's Square. He really wanted to speak before, and he even made a serious attempt before to speak, but when he went to the window, he could not speak a word. He came back very sad. Then he said to us, if I cannot celebrate in public, that was Easter, if I cannot speak to the people, it might be better for me to die. But then immediately he added, may God's will be done. So he could speak to us with great difficulty, but he could speak. He asked for a piece of paper on which he wrote, Never after he came back to this moment of great suffering. I think that these written words, totus tuus, were his last words, the last words he wrote. This had to be a great suffering for him. I mean, this after a life of so much suffering, to have this virile, active, outspoken pontiff suddenly silenced. Yes, he suffered a lot, but he was a man of a great faith as well. He was deeply convinced that his suffering was needed just for the church and for the world. We all can recall his words after the attempted assassination, that this suffering was needed by the church. And this blood shed on St. Peter's Square was needed as well. Therefore, he received this suffering with great gratitude to God. He knew that through this suffering, he could serve the church and the world. What is the lesson, the lasting lesson, after a 40-year 
association and really a brotherhood and a fatherhood, a father-son relationship with this man. What is the lesson that he leaves for you? The most profound lesson for me was being with the man who was totally dedicated to God. And this union with God, we all could feel. Nobody could speak about that openly, but we all felt it and knew it. We all knew that he was living with God and for God, and this radiated for all of us, the radiation from the other side. I repeat just what the others would say. His look, his look was exceptional. The way he looked at other men was exceptional, and people up to this day remember this. He met the millions, but he always saw the particular man. He never treated man as a mass of people. He always saw a great worth in every man. And many times we had a contact just by seeing at each other. I see that radiance that he brought to the world stage and that he brought to each life he encountered as an outgrowth of his spiritual life. You talk movingly here about his prayer life. Tell us what that was like. How did he pray? Certainly he prayed with the texts. But that prayer always went into meditation. I can recall his stay in Krakow at the cathedral in Wawel. He asked during his stay there about the moment of prayer because he wanted to pray the breviary. And he completely transcended this situation. He turned off in a certain sense. Despite so many people were around, a lot of people, TV, the media, as if all of those people did not exist. He was just for God. And this provided a great lesson for all the priests present there. We just don't say the breviary, but we pray with it. We meditate on it. This took 45 minutes. It's really interesting that the journalists didn't know what to do during that time. So he simply left him in silence. Just the picture of the Holy Father on TV for 45 minutes. But this made a great impression. And many people still return to this picture of the Pope on TV who prayed. He would get up very early, always half an hour meditation before the Mass, adoration, then the Mass, a meditated Mass. The liturgy is an activity. But for him, it wasn't just saying Mass, it was acting the mystery. He would enter into the mystery of the Holy Mass, and of course, after the Mass, the time for thanksgiving. If I can add, it was all the same during the day, later during the day. He always prayed all those whom he expected to come to see him, and after he saw them, he prayed for them as well. He thought that was the most important prayer. And it was much more important than simply a talk, talking to people. Of course, he had a great devotion to the Stations of the Cross. During the whole year, he would pray the Stations of the Cross every Friday. And during Lent, he did it every single day. Do you think he is a mystic? Many say he's a mystic. He had a mystical union with God, and he encountered and saw things that are denied the rest of us. You would know better than most. Undoubtedly, he was a mystic. It's enough to read his poetry, the Roman triptych. This is pure mystic, and all the artistic forms he used. The predominance of the mystic content over the form. All the three parts of the Roman triptych are like that. Also, the brother of our God. There is a lot of mysticism in that poem. Brother Albert. Brother Albert paints the picture of Christ, but he sees in him the poor man, the image of the poor man. And he was, of course, very young when he wrote that. Wojtyla tries to show the image of Jesus Christ in man, and he emphasizes that this image should be disclosed and shown beautifully, despite all the weaknesses and sins. Also, I want to recall, just for the clergy here, the holy hour, every Thursday, 
the Pope would make one hour of adoration. He would always go back to the fact that when Christ was going to the Olive Garden, he asked the apostles whom he brought with him, and then he makes this point to them that they could not last just one hour with him because they fell asleep. The Pope would always repeat that this is precisely what the Church lacks these days, this one hour of praying with Jesus in the Olive Garden. And he always tried hard to uh, complement this missing one hour of adoration in the Church, to complement it with his own personal prayer. I have one final question. In the Pope's will, he wrote, I wish to follow him. And part of his instruction was to destroy all of his personal letters. You decided not to do so. Why not? It depends on what kind of uh, letters or papers you mean. In those letters, we can find really profound contents. It would be very detrimental just to destroy all of this. What lacked the historical value, what lacked this value, we destroyed, but we saved the rest. For example, every year he would make his personal retreat, and during his time he took the notes. There is a lot of spirituality in, the, in these notes, just to destroy this expression of his spirituality. I simply could not do that. I, I didn't feel the power to do something like that. By the way, at some point in the future, we hope to publish at least some of those writings, because many people want to deepen his life, his life, his spirituality. And we see this in Krakow. Great numbers of pilgrims, groups, not only from Poland, also from other countries, they come to learn more about John Paul II and to follow in his steps. Before we close out our coverage, I couldn't neglect mentioning my friend, Father Richard John Newhouse, who was at my side throughout those historic days following the death of Pope John Paul and the election of Pope Benedict. At that time, repeatedly, Father Richard kept saying, you know, we shouldn't call him John Paul II. We should call him John Paul the Great. Well, it seems the church is finally catching up, Father Richard. So this weekend, we'll commemorate this important event when John Paul II, John Paul the Great, becomes blessed John Paul the Great. And we hope you'll join us for the entire coverage. It starts Saturday evening, and here's the times. You can watch it live at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Eastern in the United States. Then we'll have the beatification itself, 2.30 a.m. Eastern for those of you in the U.S., 8 p.m. Eastern also in the U.S. And then on Monday, the Mass of Thanksgiving, live at 4.30 a.m. And again, we'll encore it at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss a moment of this important coverage. It's a historic event you and your family will not forget, and we're privileged to bring it to you. You know, the few times I met Pope John Paul II, and I was privileged to join him for Mass and talk with him, even share a meal, it was uh, one of those moments you never forgot. It was as if the rest of the room and the rest of the world moved away. He was very intent and focused on the people in front of him. He had that love that uh, I think we'll hear much more about in the days ahead. And we're thrilled to bring you this family reunion of sorts from Rome, live. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. Stay with us. Good night from Vatican City.